Today, I want to tackle the question of whether reptiles actually need lighting, or whether just heating is sufficient. In order to answer this question, firstly I must address another point which you maybe haven't thought about. What is the distinction between heating and lighting? For this context, we can usefully define heat as that possession of a solid, liquid or gas which gives rise to its temperature. Heat in an enclosure is simply the process of warming it to a desired temperature, and doing this really isn't that difficult. You can use pretty much anything to do it, be that a ceramic heat emitter, a heat mat, a deep heat projector, a tungsten halogen lamp, radiators in a heated reptile room, I mean heck you can even use LEDs or fluorescent lamps if you've got a sufficient number of them. As far as getting a vivarium warm is concerned then, it doesn't particularly matter which heater you use. However, different heating methods have different implications in lighting, lighting itself being the replication of the composition and intensity of radiation found in sunlight. Radiation is most distinctly not the same thing as heat. Radiation being, as far as need concern us, UVB, UVA, visible light, infrared A, infrared B or infrared C consists of streams of energy packets which we refer to as photons. When a photon is absorbed by something, that something might be caused to warm up. In this instance, radiation has been converted to heat. Because both heat and radiation are forms of energy, radiation can be converted to heat, as just described, and likewise, heat can give rise to radiation. But again, radiation is most emphatically not the same thing as heat. Keep this in mind for the rest of the video. Now, when absorbed, Radiation does not necessarily just make something hotter. Plants, for instance, have evolved to use absorbed visible light, amongst other wavelengths, to drive the production of sugars. Many animals, including, according to our best guess, almost all herbs, have evolved to use absorbed UVB to produce vitamin D3. They've also evolved to use UVA and visible light to produce electric impulses leading to vision, and infrared A and infrared B for tissue repair. Each wavelength has many more implications for animals which I've not stated here, I've only just scratched the very surface. Note that all this doesn't mean that radiation does not warm up living things like plants and animals, of course. It just means that it has other implications as well as heating. As well we know, Herbs, especially reptiles, modulate their exposure to radiation largely in order to maintain their bodies at a desired temperature, illustrating its utility in this regard. To state plainly the conclusions just reached, radiation is both responsible for heat in a reptile and for facilitating other metabolic functions. Therefore, heating, which is the warming of an enclosure to a desired temperature, is influenced by lighting being the replication of sunlight. What I will now demonstrate is that you can achieve heating without offering any lighting, but that this is not the optimal situation for your animals. As well as its exposure to radiation, the temperature of an object, be it a rock or a reptile, depends on the temperature of the matter around it. A snake resting on a heat mat in a rack is receiving very little radiation of any kind, but it receives heat by conduction from the mat. Equally, whether the snake experience is net heating or cooling will depend on the temperature of the air around it. If this air is warmer than the snake, it will heat the snake. If the air is cooler than the snake, the snake will experience a net loss of heat to the air. Although the snake, heat, mat and air in this example are sharing energy in the form of infrared C, i.e. a form of radiation, the principal mode of energy transfer involves the direct passing of heat between adjacent substances. Here, then, heating is being achieved without lighting. Now let us consider a snake basking in nature. Although it'll be exchanging heat directly with the air and whatever else it's in contact with, just like the snake in the rack, it will also be absorbing radiation from the sun. 
The animal will stop basking once its body temperature has reached a certain value, again just as the snake in the rack will leave the heat mat once it's warmed up sufficiently. As far as heating is concerned then, the heat mat has done its job. However, remember what I said before about radiation's effects other than heating. Whereas the snake basking in nature will have been synthesising vitamin D3, experiencing the world in full colour, having its tissues healed, experiencing the joy of sunlight, and so on and so forth, the one in the rack has got nothing. Does this mean that all herbs necessarily require some form of replicated sunlight in order to survive? Well, no, it just doesn't. I mean, the majority of reptiles are kept without any form of lighting at all, and they can often live for quite a long time. But with that being said, as responsible keepers that genuinely care about the well-being of our animals, replicating sunlight is definitely something that we should aim towards. Hopefully everything I've just walked you through has primed you to see where we might be going next. There are three principal things that we can control to simulate natural conditions. Air temperature, surface temperature, and radiation. I've discussed in more detail in a previous video how we can go about measuring air temperatures and surface temperatures, and in that video I talked about why these don't matter nearly so much as people seem to think they do. If we get the radiation right, first and foremost, then so long as the air or surface temperatures in the enclosure aren't extreme, it doesn't really matter what they are, because the herb will be able to regulate its exposure to radiation in order to maintain its body temperature, just like it'd do in the wild. In the other video I just mentioned, I also discussed using weather data to determine the suitable range of air temperatures for a given herb and I stated that the air temperature across the length of the vivarium is pretty much the same. I stand by these things, but let me re-emphasise parts of the latter point as it did produce some confusion. The air temperature across the length of a vivarium is pretty much the same. Now, given that we only need our air temperature to sit in a range of a few degrees, this means that using a probe or dial thermometer sat in the shadiest part of the enclosure gives us a suitable indication of the air temperature everywhere around the enclosure. If this sounds completely frightening to you, go back and watch the other video. Actually controlling air temperatures will be the subject of some upcoming videos. With regards to replicating sunlight, I've made many videos already detailing lighting rigs which you are free to check out, but bear in mind that there is much more to come. We are on the cusp of a very big development in this area. Turning our attention to surface temperatures, in the past I've said almost nothing about them, apart from that if you can put your hand on the different objects in your herbs enclosure and none of them feel uncomfortably hot or cold to the touch, you're good to go. This comment requires a great deal of fleshing out and will be the subject of my next peer reviewed video. For today then, I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and I'll see all of you in the next video. Bye guys.